So one of the things that we did was to talk about oscillators. Talking about oscillators is, again, just, let's see if I can get rid of all this now. Talking about oscillators is just a particular kind of dynamical problem. It's one where there's an equilibrium point and a restoring force. That, by the way, doesn't have an equilibrium point and doesn't have a restoring force. When I let go of the mass, it drops. There's never nothing ever coming back. It's all just going over. On the other hand, lots of times, there, especially with, with springs, there will be an equilibrium point, a point where if you just let it go there, it doesn't accelerate. But if you move it somewhere else, like this hoop that you swing to the right, and it's hung from this uh, uh, support right here, uh, a fulcrum up here, um, if I swing it to the right and let go, there's a clockwise torque. So I swing it counterclockwise, there's a clockwise torque that pulls it back. And so there's a restoring force, just like there is for a mass on a spring. These kinds of dynamical problems are dealt with the same way. You still have either uh, translational motion, like the mass on a spring, you just have translational motion, so you just need to work with Newton's law, second law for translation, or this particular object that rocks back and forth is, is strictly rotational motion, and so you can use Newton's second law for rotational motion to, to write an equation for that motion. And what you find when there's, when there's this kind of situation is that the, the distance that you pull it away from equilibrium, this theta, tells you how far you are from equilibrium. Theta equals zero is, I drew a line from the pivot point through the center. So when this thing is hanging straight down, theta is zero, the theta that I've drawn there. So theta equals zero is, a, is an equilibrium point. When you move it away from theta, the, every time as theta gets bigger and bigger, the acceleration gets bigger. So when you're at equilibrium and theta is zero, then there's no angular acceleration. Angular acceleration, by the way, is the second derivative with respect to time of theta. And so, and, and so that's all this is. This is the translational acceleration for mass on a spring. When the acceleration depends on how far you are from equilibrium, then you have a, a, what's called not just an oscillator, but a, but a harmonic oscillator, something that a, the, a, a sine function uh, works for. And so you, for these kinds of situations, I mean, I went through this stuff here. I'm not going to go through it again. If you write down this kind of an equation, what you find, I'm going to write it because I'm going to go on to the next. Uh, what do you get? Minus g over 2r times theta. That's what I got for this, approximately, for small, small angles theta. Where, where I can approximate sine theta by theta that I've done in this, in this one step right here. Um, when you get something like that, then we talked about this last time or the, the last time we, we got together. Um, you end up with theta, theta as a function of time is just uh, a positive number, the amplitude times cosine omega t, I'm going to leave out the plus phi for right now because I don't really care about it, where omega is 2 pi divided by the period. You could call it the angular frequency because it's a frequency in radians per second. You can tell it's radians per second because whatever sits inside the cosine function can't have units. And so this 
this is a, the units of time is seconds, and so the units of omega has to be one over seconds. And in fact, radians per second is what people usually would say the units in radians are not really. So whenever you get a situation like that, you can automatically, oh, I didn't finish this. Um, whatever sits out here in front of the theta, you can write, whenever you get a situation like this kind of oscillator, you can write the second derivative of theta with respect to time equals something times theta negative something times theta. That something right there, if you take the square root of it, you find the angular frequency. Or 2 pi over t, so if you take the square root of that uh, and solve for t, you can find the period of the oscillation. Um, the reason I point that out is there's probably the, the most complicated problem on the, on the homework in o the oscillation chapter is two uniform, is this one, two uniform solid spheres uh, connected by a short light rod that's along the diameter. Okay. Two uniform solid spheres connected by uh, a short rod in between them. Doesn't weigh very much. Um, they're at rest on a horizontal tabletop. A spring with some force constant is a t has one end attached to the wall and the other end attached to a ring that passes over the center. So here's a spring. And this spring is attached to a wall, which I don't have here. But what happens is that if you pull it away from equilibrium, the trouble with this spring is its equilibrium length is completely compressed. So, so I only have one direction I can pull it away from equilibrium. The other direction doesn't exist. But anyway, if I pull it away from equilibrium, what happens when this thing is that what's supposed to be happening here, I'll show you a picture of what it looks like, uh, is that this thing oscillates back and forth while rolling back and forth. So it's doing two things. It's rolling without slipping and oscillating left and right. And both of those are going on at once. Because there's two kinds of motion, you're going to have to write down Newton's second law for both kinds of motion. So if you look at the picture of this, The force by the spring let me call that distance from equilibrium x I don't know I've got to call it something uh, this is the equilibrium point if I roll this thing to the left of the equilibrium point, then the, sp the spring pulls it back. If I roll it to the right of the equilibrium point, then the spring will push on it if, if I have a better spring than this one right here. So there's a force by the spring. Of course, there's also, uh, I'm not going to draw on, there's an earth pulling downward, the table pushing straight up, why does this thing roll? Friction. friction force. Friction force by the table. Those are the forces acting on it. I left out the vertical forces because there's, there's no acceleration in the vertical direction. So they're just going to cancel each other. And I don't need to know what the normal force is right now because I don't really care. I could always ask a question where it cares, but I'm not going to right now. So these are the forces that are acting on this thing. The net force is 
What do I want to throw away here? I don't really want to throw away any of this. I'll just say that the acceleration of, of this thing, the translational acceleration, is due to the fact that there's a force to the right and a force to the left. So F spring minus F friction. Both of those are acting, and they determine the acceleration, translational acceleration to the right or to the left. But there's also rolling going on. The rolling is determined by the net torque, and the net torque around the center of mass is again just due to the friction force. And whatever the radius of the, the friction force happens to act exactly at the at the radius r and it didn't want to do all of that can i make a circle that matches all these things eh, not too bad um, the the friction force is perpendicular to the to the radius drawn from the center of mass out to that point. So, so the torque is just F times F friction times R. These two equations can be assembled together to give you an equation that looks something like this, probably more like, depends on how you want to write it, but I would write it as, as D squared X dt equals something times x. Some constant. It's got m in it, probably. It certainly has m in it, k in it. It has r in it, because somehow it depends on the on the rotational inertia, it's going to depend on R. And so it's going to have things like that in it, but you can write these two things together as a single equation. By the way, maybe I should have pointed out that the spring force is, is K times X. I should call this minus x and use a proper spring force. The spring force, if, if this is, no, I shouldn't call it minus x. I should call, <laughs> I should call that x and say, well, here I've stretched it, and so x is negative, and the force is positive, and so minus kx makes sense there. Yeah. How, how do we? Um, so it, it's saying to it's saying to show that it's harmonic. Don't don't we need to show that it's don't we need a, a, an equilibrium point to know that? Um, the there there will be an equilibrium point when the spring is not stretched. I mean, I can't show you one here because I don't have a good spring. But but when the spring is at its natural length. It's not going to be pulling on the on these things when the spring is at its natural length. Okay, that's right there. And this table's not horizontal. Um, when the spring is at its natural length, this thing won't. Uh, let me do that. When the spring's at its natural length, this thing won't won't move. But But when it's away from its natural length, then it'll be pulled back. And when it's too far to your left, then it'll be pushed away. So, so there is an equilibrium point. That's just the point where the, where the spring is at its equilibrium length. So if you're over here to the left, 
If, it's, if you've rolled it over to the left, you've stretched the spring out, the spring's pulling back. If you were over here to the right, so you'd compress the spring, then the spring would be pushing to the, to the left. So there is an equilibrium point, and you should be able to show, using these two equations, that the second derivative of x with respect to t is the negative of some constant times x itself. And then that constant is, sorry, the square root of that constant is 2 pi divided by the period until you can find the period. That's basically the way to, to deal with oscillators. If something's oscillating and it's a harmonic oscillator, all you need to know is the period. Or, and well, eventually you also need to know how far away from equilibrium you initially pulled it to let it go. So you also need to know the amplitude. But once you know the amplitude and the period, then you know everything about the motion of the thing because it just repeats itself over and over again. So we, we, because we don't need to find the amplitude, we don't need how far it's pulled. Yeah, there's nothing, there's, it doesn't say anything about how far you started it, how much energy you gave it. So, so none of those things come up. All it says is show that the motion is simple harmonic. In other words, show that. And then find the period. And when you show this, there will be something with M's and R's and stuff like that sitting in it. And the square root of that is 2 pi divided by the period. Any questions about this? Is another very complicated situation where you have both rotational motion and translational motion, and they're connected together. I didn't even write that part. The acceleration. Is, can, is again, because it rolls without slipping, again connected to the angular acceleration by the radius 